Um, I'm going to read Matthew 24. Start there and see what happens. Um, Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So this is Jesus answering the disciples um, about the end of the age. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come into my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, I, don't, I, I never believe that was many men coming, claiming that they were the Messiah. Right. I mean, that's almost too blatant and obvious. It's many shall come in my name, at, professing that they believe that Jesus, Jesus is the Christ, Christ, and shall deceive many. Uh, I'm going to stop and as as I get these thoughts. I'll, when I was in First Corinthians, uh, in First Corinthians, the Paul says, "I hear there there are divisions among you, and I partly believe it." So one says, "I'm of Apollos," and another says, uh, "I'm of Paul," and another says, "Oh, I I'm after Cephas," and still another says, "I'm of Christ." Yeah. <laughs> you know, was Paul crucified? Uh, was Peter crucified for you, or were you, did, were you baptized in the name of Paul? And he goes on, there's divisions among you. A lot of preachers uh, springboard off of that to preach against the denominational divisions amongst organized religious Christianity, quote-unquote, which for us is not Christianity. It's the counterfeit of doctrines and commandments of, uh, commandments of men. It's, it's part of the religious system of men, the identity of denominations. Denominations is division. There is, you know, is Christ divided? Christ is not divided. So, it's the Babylon, mother of harlots, and we could go on, come out of her, my people. But what struck me there was, you mean, you can, you can say, oh, I don't give credence or honor to any man, I'm of Christ, and you can say that to the disunity of the body? Yeah. It's even possible to do that, you see. And then uh, early in my Christian walk, it was uh, the blatant example to me was uh, I, I would listen to the radio. I think it was WWVA back in the um, probably the eighties, nineties, and there was a the, there was um, a controversy amongst apostolics. You know, do you have apostolic oneness? Do you have UPC, and you have I don't know what else you have. You have. Church of the Lord Jesus Christ of the apostolic faith, and then you had another church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the apostolic faith. <laughs> so you had these two branches of apostolic uh, churches. The one was was debating that they're in and they're not of, and that if you, you, it's not enough to be of, you got to be in. Uh -huh. And so if you're of, you're hell bound because you got to be in. So here they are; they're both claiming that they are of Christ to the disunity between them. And they, you know, that is a very subtle thing about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ of the apostolic faith. It's just that subtle additional tag of identifying themselves of the apostolic faith. And as it falls out, as you can see how it falls out and unfolds, uh, people identify themselves as apostolic Oh, we're apostolic. In other words, apostolic is something unique from other denominational. Well, there is, you know, we've been through that issue. Our identity is Jesus Christ and, and nothing else. Not of the Latter-day Saints, not of the apostolic faith, not in the apostolic faith, not because of the apostolic faith. We're simply the body of Christ. Yeah. Anyway, and there's other things that that those denominations practice that manifest themselves to be... Uh, a daughter of the whore, no matter how much they speak in tongues or no matter what they claim they say when they baptize or anything else. So uh, when I was, uh, I was preaching one time, and uh, in my experience in the UPC as a oneness church, and their banner is Acts 2.38, you know, which is a, a lot of the apostolic churches 
put a big focus on Acts 2.38, repent, and, uh, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the, of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to your children's children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And that's that was our banner in the in the oneness churches, and then gradually, uh, uh, I spent some time with Brother Glenn, the evangelist in Pembroke, who was a man who actually had a vision up from Jesus Christ, stand before him and say, in the in the area you're in, which is in Pembroke, you are my evangelist. And when I started to have fellowship with him, that began in an independent Christian assembly. But he ended up coming out of there, and then uh, I, I won't go into the details. But when I had fellowship with him, uh, he began preaching Babylon, mother of harlots, the religious structure, the organized religious denominational structure, come out of her, my people. I, I had I, that bore witness to me, and so I followed through on that, came out of the oneness churches, and he, he's the first one who began to spiritualize and talk about faith in the operation of God, and the real purpose of God is to perfect a man, to take you from the uh, carnal state to the spiritual state to prepare to meet God and uh, all the allegorical things in the Bible. And uh, what really constituted holiness and sanctification and salvation and following on to know the Lord and not just some kind of denominational banner or uh, mandate, uh, Acts 2.38, that, that we got to convince everybody to say Jesus' name when you're baptized. Uh, it may not that may not have been how everybody thought of it in the UPC, but it was pretty prevailing that that was their banner, and it seemed to be at the expense of expounding the rest of the purpose of God. Okay, they didn't really talk a whole lot about not the eternal purpose of God and getting down into the nitty gritty of you know uh, why God made man and the whole idea of worship and how to perfect worship and how to accomplish the perfection of the saints. Their big uh, drive was this Acts 2.38 issue. And it seemed to be at the exclusion of the rest of the counsel of God, for the most part. And any time that there was something that, that seemed to resemble a description of the purpose of God, it was either very, it was incomplete or it wasn't, wasn't enough. It didn't reach everybody, you know. So having said that, uh, I used to look at Acts 2.39 <laughs> and say... With many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. So I began to think, okay, Acts 2.38, Acts 2.38, Acts 2.38, where are all these many other words? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I began to get, uh, I began to receive some of those many other words from Brother Glenn. And then around uh, 2002, when we moved to South Carolina and we became part of the Overcomer Ministry, we we heard many, uh, many other of those other words. Because yeah. Brother Stair talked a lot about God's mystery and why has God made man. And we, we, he, he expounded many of those other words that the oneness people didn't. So I remember pointing that out in the service one day. That here we are, and while we, were, we are beginning to hear from the Overcomer Ministry, many of these other words. And I was reproving the oneness people. And commending the work that was going on at that time in the Overcomer Ministry for bringing us these many other words. So, you know, so I was always grateful that I was with Brother Glenn and for the time we had there at that at, at the Overcomer Ministry and the things that we learned about God's eternal purpose. And you know, I've tried to follow through on all of that stuff Can, and continue with it. But anyway, this is the end of the age, and you know, you can say, "I am of Christ." to the disunity of the body. I thought that was very, very striking uh, idea, uh, precept to consider. Uh, I remember, uh, for here's another example. Okay, so I told you how that plays out on a denominational level. Two denominations, both saying, I'm of Christ, but we're, we're of Jesus Christ in the apostolic face. Yeah, well, we're Jesus Christ of the apostolic face. Can you, can you imagine arguing over a preposition? Yeah. So I actually heard messages where the guy said, where are those in people? They're hellbound. Or where are those of people? Then we're not of, we're in. We're not of, we're in. <laughs> it went on like that. I thought, well, this is, this is a little bit over the top for me. I couldn't, 
And that's, that's you know, I, I, when I was exposed to things like that, that's when it made me question, wow, even the apostolic, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, thinking they've got the scoop on baptism and they're the ones to tell the other denominations how to do it, even their divisive over their embrace of Jesus. Now, on a personal level, there was a, 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 a woman that was um, a sister in the UPC when I was there, and she was embittered and a little disenchanted with what she thought was hypocrisy in the church and we could talk about that too like sometimes well what is hypocrisy there's hypocrisy of the flesh there's hypocrisy of the heart and there's two different kinds of brands or uh, manifestations of hypocrisy i mean if you want to look at it at a at a certain level you could say no matter where you go, people are striving to come on to perfection and nobody has come to perfection yet. So you'll say p people profess that something is holy and righteous that you should do and they themselves may not do it. Now they may be hypocrites in heart or maybe they're not. Maybe they're like the Christians in Romans chapter 7. They really want to do what they're saying and professing, but they're still in bondage and the good that they, they would do, they cannot do because they haven't. You know, you could say that. Well, a person in, the, in, in a condition of Romans chapter 7 is not necessarily a hypocrite in heart. So what I'm saying is no matter where you go, no matter what church, no matter what congregation, if you want to, you can, you can tag hypocrisy if you want. Anyway, the woman was disenchanted. She was embittered of what she thought was hypocrisy at the uh, Oneness Church. And uh, so one day it was testimony time and she got up and she said, I just want everybody to know. I'm not here because of pastors, so-and-so. So. I'm not here because of the brother over here or the sister over here. I'm not, I'm not sitting in this pew because of you or you or you. I'm here for Jesus Christ, and I'm here for Jesus Christ only. <laughs> so what's she saying? She's saying, I'm of Christ. I am of Christ, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians. But she was doing it to the disunity. She was separating herself from the rest of the body and exalting herself. Yeah, the rest so, can go to hell. Yeah, and the rest you can go to hell. But what about the scripture about hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus Christ and all towards all the saints? You know, so how can you separate the head from the body, regardless of where along the, the road of salvation your brother or sister may be? How much they've attained to perfection or haven't attained? And if they're walking according to what they've attained, then you, they're accepted, just like you and I. Anyway, isn't that something? You can say, I am of Christ, to, to the separating of yourself from the whole body of Christ. Because, oh, I'm of Christ. And you can do it in a way that separates yourself. So many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. This is what we've heard... Uh, we're, we're, well, we're well past all of that. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes, diverse places. You know, there's a lot of people who say, oh, we've had these things in every generation. and is, This is no different. Well, I disagree with that. I think this, I think this is a very unique generation. I, I think uh, if you just want to be honest and research it if you want to research it and i don't do a whole lot of that kind of researching but i remember the things that i hear and i remember the things that have a kind of spirit of truth behind it even secular things there's way more earthquakes now than there has ever been we have the witness of world wars and we've heard all of that stuff before these are the beginnings of sorrows they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake and then shall many be offended and we can see that in our generation why? Because iniquity abounds. Iniquity. Not just in the people of God, but in the rulers of the people. Iniquity. Everywhere. How many how often have we visited the issue that the whole heart, the whole the whole body is sick, the head is sick, the heart is faint, the body has no soundness, open wounds, fruit putrefying sores, no soundness, no mollifying of ointment, there's no all of that. That all is because iniquity abounds. Iniquity abounds. Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 34, warning, woe is the pastors. What was the issue with the pastors? Primarily, they were feeding themselves. Iniquity. 
pursuing their own pleasure, their own lust, their own agenda, their own, you know, bearing rule by their own means. And then the iniquity of the people love to have it so. And what are you going to do in the end thereof? And iniquity abounds and love of many waxes cold. And, you know, the ministry loves their pleasure more than they love the people of God. And, and grace becomes exploited. Uh, you know, authority becomes exploited. And, and you go on down the line. And many are offended. The Bible says, be not many masters. You don't want to covet being a master or a person of authority. Uh, if God gives it to you, that's one thing. Then you have to rise up to the responsibility or fulfill the responsibility of it by the power of God, by the grace of God, by faith in Jesus Christ, what, however God helps you to do that. But be not many masters, uh, because in many things... In many things, we offend all. We offend all. So there's different ways that the ministry of the people of authority offends. Sometimes we offend because we're simply telling the truth. Yeah. And it challenges the course of life you're taking or some activity that you're pleasuring yourself with. And I'm not just talking about sex. I'm just saying whatever. Whatever your will is. And it challenge, challenges you to separate from the world. It challenges you to make a stand against ungodliness, unholiness, unrighteousness. We'll take the present holiday season, Christmas. How many people struggle to make a stand against Christmas and they don't have trouble doing it to a stranger, but then when it gets to their family, they don't want to make the, the stand against Christmas because it may yeah. stir something up, right? I'm just saying as an example, these are the things that we wrestle with and, uh, so be not many masters, the, the Word of God's going to challenge you on those issues. It's going to compel you to take a change or a course of action that's, that might bring affliction or persecution upon you, and that's we have to wrestle through all that. And, uh, and, and the other thing is that if you remember Jesus, who did no sin, you know, when Jesus was reviled, who did no sin, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, Jesus was the green tree. And that you see what they did to him. And he was a perfect example. Who, who did no sin. Neither was there any guile. So the ministers come along. And we have. We are in flesh. So there are certain things we do that are. Manifested, manifestations of sin. And again. To a certain degree you have to allow for that. Even in the ministry. But not the excess of sin. Not the superfluity of sin. Not sin committed in such a way that you take advantage of your position or your authority or your anointing or you take advantage of the drawing power that the Holy Ghost has put upon you to draw people. You know, ministers have an anointing of the Holy Ghost. No man can come, Jesus said, except the Father draw them. Well, Jesus is the high priest. He's at the right hand of God. So who's God going to draw them to? He's going to draw them to ministers and the body of Christ wherever it's established. So there's a drawing power of God. That can be exploited. That can turn into idolatry. That can turn into a lot of things. So anyway, so in many things we offend all. So we could offend either in, in righteousness or when the unrighteousness of sinful flesh is manifested and it gives an occasion for someone to qu question. Yeah, it, the, it, It's the whole type of uh, Samuel. When they said, oh, look, the people said, "Look, you, Samuel, your your sons aren't like you. They 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 pervert judgment and they take bribes. So therefore, make us a king like the heathen." Well, that very much displeased Samuel. What displeased Samuel? What displeased Samuel is when it made them say, "Make us a king." He said, "You say make us a king when the Lord your God is your king." Yeah. Okay. It it didn't say that they were wrong about identifying the error of Samuel's sons. It's just that you can't let that knowledge uh, affect you or provoke you in such a way that you don't want Jesus to be your king anymore. You want to live like the heathen. God will deal with error in the ministry. We, we know that. And then, like I say, to a certain degree, it's going to be a manifestation of that because we're all part of the common salvation but again I say there is a difference between a certain degree of that that you see and th because of that, that that may offend some right 
Well, look, look at what they did to Jesus in the green tree. Then what are they going to do in the dry? Yeah. They call the master of the house, Beelzebub, who did no sin, no guile. And then the ministry has to go on to perfection like the rest of the saints. So it's possible there's a potential for them to manifest uh, guile or whatever. Like I say, to a certain degree, well, that's going to be even easier. Well, you, you really, we really got to... Uh, Seek God and uh, know who God sends and who God doesn't send. And we have to know what is righteousness and what is not righteousness. And I'm not saying Christians have to submit to unrighteousness or guile or deceit that comes from the ministry. You don't have to, you don't have to submit yourself to that. You don't have to. But it just becomes another occasion for people to get offended. And, that's, and Paul knew that. That's why Paul said, I keep my body under. I keep my fleshly body under. I keep it under subjection with all that power of God that I can, with, with every effort, righteous effort and righteous motivation that I can. I keep my body under. It's not that I beat my body, like beat it in a game of something. It's not like I beat my body with a baseball bat. I just keep it under. I do everything I can not to ma manifest anything that could be an occasion to offend the saints. Yeah. But I certainly don't go into deliberate pursuit of any kind of sin. Certainly, yeah. I don't do that. Being that the, yeah. Giving no offense in anything. Giving no offense in anything. So the ministry is not blamed. You didn't think Paul didn't carry that as a banner, like frontlets before his eyes, that he was constantly... Uh, deliberately, consistently, all the time, have, have that in the forefront of his conscience, in consideration of the saints. Anyway, so, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. So therefore, uh, whether I'm in the Romans chapter 7 condition or not, if I do things as a man of God, or as a minister, as a prophet, as a teacher, and I do things that give occasion for saints to be offended, I will receive the greater judgment, condemnation, severe consequence. Unto whomsoever much is given, much is required. As examples to the flock. Examples. Be an example, he said to, to Timothy, in all holiness and purity and doctrine and Fasting and godliness and charity and be an example to the believers. Whosoever shall both do and teach these commandments shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever shall not do and teach these commandments, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. More is given, more is required. You think God does not require more of a holy lifestyle from the church than he requires of the unsaved? He certainly does. And then likewise, within the church, he requires more of a demonstrated example of purity and holiness and righteous living from the ministry as examples to the flock. Not rhetoric. I mean, the rhetoric can, can be there. I mean, we want to be saying the right rhetoric as well. But rhetoric by itself is just not enough. As I said before, the holiness of God, the issue of holiness, is that we follow on and we perfect the holiness, having therefore, beloved, these precious promises, let us perfect uh, holiness of the spirit and flesh. Let, and let us perfect holiness. That means flesh. Clean the inward first, that the outward may appear clean also. So holiness, therefore, becomes what you do. It, it, holiness of God has to be a manifestation in your flesh, unto your brethren and unto the world, manifested in your flesh, righteous actions, righteous deeds, righteous lifestyle, and it goes way beyond just what I say is the rhetoric of God. You're not just holy. You can't just say in a rhetorical way, oh, I'm holy simply because God said I'm holy. And if God said it, poof, I'm holy. 
It doesn't matter what I do. I'm holy. No, no, no. Holiness goes way beyond the rhetoric of God. It goes way beyond just because God said it. And I'm saying if God just said it, it will follow through all the way into your lifestyle. Okay. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you. Many shall be offended. Many shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. He that it shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We see that? Have we seen perversion in ministry? People driven away? And some of us are, are trying to hold fast what we have received and, and continue in the pursuit of salvation and holiness and righteousness. And others have been offended. We've seen others fall away. They become prey to every beast of the field out there in the world. Prey to every worldly spirit. They're offended. Some of them don't even want to be Christians anymore. Some of them don't want to be married to their spouses anymore. Some of them, they're falling away. They're offended. And we're fighting to hold this fellowship on broken pieces of the ship, as it were, in Acts 27, like the Eurocladin story. Remember? How the, the, the ship was broken into pieces and then everybody had to get saved by grabbing onto broken pieces of the ship. And there's some people who didn't grab pieces of the ship. They were strong enough to try to swim to the shore and what have you. Well, that's what we're like now. We're like holding onto a broken piece of the fellowship of, of Christ. As we're in this end of the age, iniquity abounds. Love of many waxes cold. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay, so the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. This is another thing that points us to the end of the age, is the advent of technology. And we can go on and on and on about this, but most of us here know about the, uh, the prophesying of the... Uh, Mark of the beast in Revelation 13. No man could buy or sell, sell save he had a mark in his right hand or in his forehead. So never before in the history of mankind could the world have a universal uh, economic system and also a universal religious system or any kind of world kind, worldwide unity and governing that could simultaneously uh, oversee the entire world economically without technology. Technology is that vehicle that the devil is going to ride in on and he's going to use it to consolidate everything and bring that whole one world government, one world economic system, cashless society. There's another buzzword of, the, of eschatology, the study of the end of the age. Cashless society. Do you see it all happening? It's going to move towards all of that. That's, that's extremely obvious, <laughs> extremely obvious. I mean, if that is such a plausible, intreatable idea in our de generation of technology that you couldn't hardly fathom in any other generation without technology. Uh, Brother Stair read off a, a, um, something called the Prophecy of St. Nihilus. I'm not sure if he was Catholic or what he was, but it was... And I don't remember exactly when, it was like a long time ago, like a thousand years ago or fifteen hundred years ago, at least hundreds and hundreds of years ago, the prophecy of Nihilus made a reference to, uh, quote, unquote, man shall develop a perverted wisdom, he said. A perverted wisdom whereby one man shall be able to talk to another man at the other side of the world. No, the only... Uh, Error, if you want to say error about this prophecy, is he tagged it around the 19th century when he should have probably said the 20th century. But the prophecy of Nihilus, and you can Google it; it's it's on it's it's um, it's on the internet. You can you can Google it and and uh, have access to it there. If you read it, it's pretty spot on, really, about the end of the age. So technology. And that also through technology is how the gospel can be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Now, I think it's Luke. I mean, there's a, there's a, a chapter for the end of the age in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, 
I think it's Luke 13 or whatever. But in one of those it says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be published among all nations. And there's another little key there, because, and this goes back a little further now in time, but this is why we consider that the, the reformation of the church, like when Luther came out of the Catholic church, that's, that's pretty much... Uh, identified as the beginning of the Reformation, the re reform of the church. And each of these men of God that came out of the Ch Catholic Church had a little plank, a piece of the doctrine of Christ, which they were given by God and which God used them to magnify. For Martin Luther, it was the just shall live by faith, by grace are you saved, not of works. That was Luther's whole platform, his focus. That's what he was known for. And then, Calvin came out and he was known for the predestination aspect of the doctrine of Christ. And the church, slowly God began restoring precept by precept over a period of time, over the course of hundreds of years, the, the truth and the purity of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And we know God couldn't do it all at once because man couldn't handle it all at once. But anyway... When did the scriptures begin to be published? It was around that same time. The Gutenberg Bible. Right, German Gutenberg Bible, which became, you know, Luther was involved in st stuff, and eventually it became to be the uh, 1611 authorized King James Version of the Bible, which we know now to be the God-ordained English language, the only God-ordained legitimate English language scripture that is ordained and sanctioned by God for the church's use to preach to the saints and preach the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the world or so that the end of the world can come. So it's interesting. Here in Matthew it says, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. And in Luke, I think it is, it says, this gospel shall be published. So he's got it covered both ways. It's either preached or it's published. So, you know, the Reformation and starting around the 16, late 1500s, 1600s, and coming around to the establishment of the King James Version of the Bible, this was... God beginning to restore and bring things slowly into the end of the age where the gospel could be published. And now, boy, now the Bible has been published everywhere, far and wide, and it's been all over the place. In fact, the Bible has been so widely published that people have, uh, they've all, almost uh, done away with its importance. You know, when you keep getting more and more and more of something, its value seems to diminish you know, if I have a rare coin and it's the only coin of its kind, its worth is very valuable. But if, but if I have a coin where there's, where there's millions of coins, no one's that much interested in it anymore. And I'm not saying the Bible doesn't have any value anymore, but, I mean, I walked into the dollar store one day and I walked to the back and I saw King James versions of the Bible for a buck, you know. It's kind of like that's what's happened. They've relegated the King James version of the Bible to the back of a dollar store. It's worth a buck. <laughs> and they don't care about <laughs> salvation. They just they they can make a buck off of it, <laughs> right? And so, this is our, the generation surely that has made merchandise of the things of God like no other. TV preachers, evangelists, all the call of money, and too many preachers today still are um, are correlating their favor with God with how much money they get. And that's, that's no measure of your approval of God at all, Amen. ever. That has nothing to do with your approval from God. You know, we've, we've heard it. I've heard preachers say it. If, if you think I'm not doing God's will, then how come God sent me this much money? How come God sent me that much money? Well, I mean, if you need money, God can send you money. But if that's the only criteria you're putting forth about your favor with God, you're, you're missing it. But I thought that's interesting. So Gospel of the Kingdom, it's covered in preaching in all the world, and it's published among all nations. And how could that happen except in our generation? Okay, it couldn't happen back... If, well, there you go. It began to be published in the 1600s, but the prolific publication of the Bible has reached our generation. And notice, 
It shall be preached in the all, on the, into the whole world. It shall be published among nations. What? To have mighty revivals and get a good bunch of people saved? No! It's only going out like that for a witness. That's the only reason it's going forth. It's for a witness. So God can leave men without excuse. It's the same reason why we preach or say things. Uh, we, it's, there's got to be more to us preaching, witnessing, living holy. Uh, there's got to be more to it than just in the hope that people get saved. Now I know that we're here as a manifestation of the Son. And the, Jesus Christ said that uh, I have come that the world through me might be saved. So the manifestation is of the Son is somewhat to introduce the possibility or opportunity for people to be saved. However, we know that most people will not be saved. We know that few there be there find it. So there's got to be more motivation than just that. If, it, if they're not saved, then we're doing all of this to set up judgment. If I had not come, Jesus said, and spoken unto them what no other man spoke unto them, then they, they would, ha would not have had sin. But now they have both seen and hated both me and my Father. For judgment I have come into the world. Now I myself here, while I'm in the flesh, Jesus said, when he was in the flesh, he said, I myself, I'm not going to judge any man. That was when he was here in the flesh. But what does the Bible say when he comes the second time? It comes in flaming fire. God is going to judge the world by that man whom he hath ordained. Jesus Christ, the judge of the quick and the dead. Those of us who was quickened, we're, we're going to be judged. The dead, those dead in their sins and trespasses, he is going to judge. He's going to say to the sheep in his right hand, Come, enter into everlasting life for the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And on the left it says to the goats, depart from me. He's going to judge them. Depart from me into everlasting, into the, uh, into everlasting uh, lake of fire, everlasting destruction, punishment. Now I have this in my notes and I might, go, I might read out of Matthew 25 after 24, but I'm, I'm, if I have time. All right. So when you sh therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, Spoken up by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that get suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. That's where your great tribulation comes in the end of the age. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. Now, I've always believed it's not possible. The Spirit of truth shall lead you and guide you into all truth. If it were possible which it's not because God's going to inspire us to give all diligence the Spirit of truth will lead us and guide us into all truth. Well, uh, there's lots of people and lots of manifestations, so-called of the Holy Ghost and miracles and everything else, and I'm not going to get too much into it right now. It's a, it's a very touchy subject and that you don't want to call the works of the Holy Ghost the works of the devil. But the other side to that is that because the gifts and the calling are without repentance and because <coughs> the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets themselves, if the prophets... Uh, that God gives the prophets the potential to operate their gift outside of the context of God's purpose. Okay, you know, lots, there's lots of miracle working evangelists t on TV and everything else. It's, it's like I said before. I mean, and name names and everything else. I, I don't want to name names anymore tonight. Uh, I have named names in the past, but but when when Peter did a notable miracle. It attracted the attention of the people momentarily. It put a focus on him. 
which he took as an opportunity to bring the blood guiltiness of Jesus upon them. He said, he's preaching Jesus Christ, whom you with wicked hands have slain and crucified. And then he throws them some slack. Now I know through ignorance you did it. But now you have to repent. That's what he used, that's what he said when given an opportunity to speak to people whose attention was riveted upon him after doing a notable, notable miracle. Well, when's the last time you saw a miracle preacher supposedly do miracles on stage and everything? And by the way, a lot of those miracles can be re rebuffed if you follow through on them. But I think some of them may be legitimate. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. But when is the last time a, a, an evangelist, TV evangelist, does a notable miracle on a TV show with a whole crowd of people, and he uses the opportunity to point to everybody and say, you with wicked hands, you have slain Jesus Christ. All of you repent. Come out of your denominational divisions. You know, live holy and righteous. Get rid of all your riches and follow Jesus. And I'm not going to say that because they're after the riches themselves. Yeah. So, and I'm saying it's possible that the anointing that's present might even be the Holy Ghost. But it's subject to them. It's not subject to God. God gave them the gift. You exercise the gift. It's subject to the prophets. That's the whole significance of Lord. Oh Lord, we prophesied in thy name. And Lord, and we've done many mighty works in thy name. And we've cast out devils in thy name. And thou was taught in our streets. And the Holy Ghost presence, you were with us week after week after week. Service after service. Crusade after crusade. Oh God, you were with us. Yeah, the Bible says, yeah. Yeah, that, that uh, God gave the gifts unto men and God gave them gifts. Yea, even to the rebellious He gave gifts that God might dwell among them. Jesus, you know, Jesus said, right? Depart from me, you worker of... Yeah, you name your ministry after your own name. Or you obsess excessively over all the things that God is doing through you. Or you, under the guise or under the pretense of magnifying your office... You're glorifying attention to yourself in proportion way beyond what you ever would glorify Jesus Christ to the people who are before you. Remember? You know, I, I have no, no problem encouraging preachers. Preach on, brother. What a preacher. But if you give 10,000 what a preachers and you only give one or two what a saviors, then yeah. you, it's disproportionate, isn't it? See, when, so what's the problem there? The problem is the excess. The obsessing on it. The excess, the superfluity. Now I'm going to go with something else here. So I, I wasn't sure if I was going to go here, but I am going to. The 70 returned again. Remember he sent out the 70 by twos and said, Behold, I give you power over unclean spirits. You know, Preach the gospel, cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead. I'm giving you power, go do all this stuff. And so then they come back. Seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Remember, I'm relating this back to the people who said, Oh, Lord, we have cast out devils. They're taking particular notice. They're noticing and they're obsessing and they're looking for all the things that God has done through them. They want to glory in it. They want to know and pay attention to what God is doing through them. Now, just re remember that because I'm going to make another point after this. So, said, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through thy name. They are delighting, glorying in all this power that's taking place through them. They're not really focusing on the purpose of God here. All right. And he said unto them, what did he say unto them? Did he say unto them, oh, that's very good, you 70. I'm glad that you've noticed the power, that my great power that's taking place through you. I'm so glad that you noticed. Is that what he said? <laughs> or, did, or did he say, as I heard one person say once, who was a man who would pray for the sick and they would be healed, and I'm not going to name him. I know who he is. But he said, you know, he said, I prayed for someone to be healed once and they were healed. And did you know that Jesus said to me, thank you? So Jesus was thanking the minister 
Well, that's what kind of iniquity is going on here. So he said unto them, no, what he said unto them, when they said, all the devils are subject to us through the name, he said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning. That, that's how Satan fell. <coughs> Obsessing and becoming um, focused in an iniquitous way upon self, the glory of God that was taking place through him, and it blinded him from the will of God and the purpose of God, and and it pushed him towards iniquity. And of course, Satan, not knowing his, not able to appreciate death and his sufficiency being of God, Jesus said, "Look, Satan did all that. That's how Satan fell by beginning to notice and then obsess over." Uh, what God was doing through him, and then the focus, his focus became on himself. That's what happens with ministers, if they, under the pretense of magnifying their office, if they do it in, in excess, they're focusing, they're forcing a focus upon themselves. Both to themselves, they're doing it, and onto the people. They're forcing, forcing the focus of the people onto themselves more than Christ. Now I know Peter John, they saw the man and they said, look on us. So men of God do have to magnify their office. I'm not saying they don't. But I'm talking about degrees and proportions and it be, having it become iniquity. So, not with, okay, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you, notwithstanding in this rejoice not. Don't rejoice. And don't obsess over all the things God's doing through me. Through me. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Focus is going to end up on yourself and be taken away from the Lord. And you're going to fall in this condemnation of the devil. That's why in the qualifications of a bishop, Paul said, don't, don't use a novice. A novice hasn't been through enough affliction to know that enough that his sufficiency is of God and not of himself. And if you put him in a ministering position, a position of authority, a position of being a bishop, he'll start rising up and God will begin using him and he'll upset, he'll think it's him and he be lifted up in pride and fall in the condemnation of the devil. This is precisely what Jesus is saying to the 70 here. Precisely. And so what is, then what does he say? He says, don't rejoice the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Yeah. Rejoice because you are in pursuit and you are a possessor of eternal life and you work that out. You obsess about that. Not the things that God is doing through you or through me. Okay, and to, uh, and then Jesus finally says, there, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so seem good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me and my Father. No man knows who the Son is but the Father. And who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And then he turns to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Now, remember when I taught on this before? The uh, example in um, Ecclesiastes, there was a great city and very few men in it, which is the church. Few there be that find it. The church is the minority. It's very few. And an uh, enemy came and besieged it and built great bulwarks and imprisonments around about it. And there was, in that city, there was a poor wise man. And the poor wise man, what, by his big hoopla, and by drawing all the attention to how great he was and all the things God was doing through him, did he deliver the city? No. He delivered the city by his wisdom. And the thing about wisdom is wisdom is a subtle Subtle. Wisdom is subtle. It is not blatant. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Be wise as subtle as the serpent is. Even subtler, but harmless as doves. 
You know, this is not a direct con confrontational blow against blow against blow against blow going to deliver this city. You know, people are full of iniquity. They're full of chips on their shoulders. They're full of, of, of all kinds of, of bondage and things, uh, defensiveness and rebellion and all kinds of things. The wisdom that delivers the city of God and sets Christ free in you is very subtle. It's so subtle that the person you're exercising the wisdom on may not even be aware that the work of God is searching him out. Now, every man seems just in his own cause, but then the neighbor that has wisdom, he, see he seeks it out. Well, this seems like it's right, but I'm not sure. Let's seek this out. There's something subtle going on here. So there's subtle in evil and there's subtle in righteousness. He that wins souls is wise. Now, I mean, like, but we as individuals don't win the soul. But if God is using you to impart wisdom or counsel to help deliver your brother or to get him to acknowledge or come to some point of conviction, it's going to work in subtlety. Wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. That suggests that the person who is working in godliness is not obsessing over what God is doing through him. And does not feel the compelling need to excessively talk and point out to everybody what God is doing through him. Because remember, the wise man, poor wise man by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet nobody remembered the poor wise man. Yeah. He was not seeking big profile here. Now, even in the magnifying of your office, you don't want to start exaggerating and obsessing and uh, over it and try to overdo that. Because this poor man who delivered the city, he had no profile. Jesus had no former comeliness. Jesus made himself of no, no reputation. No reputation. He, he deliberately said, I, I, I'm not seeking a reputation. Because he, he, he had a, a work from God. And he understood all these things. And he was setting the example for us to follow. And finally, that brings us to what I was going to say in Matthew 25. It's a perfect lead into Matthew 25. Now this is Matthew 25 verses 34 to 42. Then you go further to 46. Yeah, to 46. You must spiritualize this scripture. Now, some scriptures, you, you know, prophecy can be filled literally as it's spoken. And then there's always a sort of a spiritual fulfillment of, of the pattern of the physical, literal fulfillment. You know, like Jesus was born. Like we were talking about the Christmas whole, the whole Christmas thing. Jesus Christ was actually literally born, right? The Son of God. But then you, there's also a fulfillment of it, which is like a parable. It's allegorical. It's, uh, it's, spiritualized where Christ is born in our us too well he comes forth in our flesh so there's that both fulfillments but this scripture has to be spiritually discerned it has to be and you'll see why so then shall the king say to them on his right hand come you blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world for I was a hungered and you gave me meat I was thirsty you gave me drink I was a stranger and you took me in I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Yeah, Lord, aren't you glad we did all those things? Yeah, I remember when, uh, when it was my purpose and goal to go down and see you in the prison. Is that what they said? <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm making a mocker. I'm, I'm making a point. No. Then shall the righteous say, answer him, saying, Lord, when? When did we see you a hunger and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? When did we see you sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, As much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren. That's the first point. That Matthew 25 here is only talking of what, what people did unto their brethren. Not to the heathen, but what they did unto their brethren. So this is a, a fulfillment of this scripture takes place within the church. 
The fulfillment of this scripture is not someone going down to the Colleton County Jail and going to each cell and talking to him about Jesus and say, Lo, I fulfilled the scripture. I, Jesus was in prison and I visited him. <laughs> no, it, if I, by my self-will and by my own determination, deliberately, knowingly, go down to the prison and start preaching to people, I know I've gone to the prison, right? And I know who I've talked to. So that's not the state of these people. These people didn't even realize the fullness of how the purpose of God was being fulfilled through them because God himself was using the individual vessels in such a subtlety that just by nature you were saying the things of God, just by nature you were living the holy righteous life and having an effect on people in a way that was even beyond what you even realized. You know, we're going to get to the judgment day and we're going to see things. If we're the righteous, we're going to see things that were done and accomplished and fulfilled in us that we didn't even realize. Just by being faithful and doing what God told us to do, we we don't even know how far reaching the effects are of the things that we say and do in the name of the Lord, right? Just like I keep going back to Peter who began to rebuke Jesus, and Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan. You don't savor the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Satan was using Peter. He was trying to use Peter to put a monkey wrench in the entire plan of salvation so that the sins of the world would not be covered by the death of Jesus Christ, by getting Peter to try to save Jesus from the cross. Well, Peter did not appreciate or understand just how far-reaching and, and how... how um, how evil and destructive his motions were going to be. He, did, he didn't understand all of that, so, but Satan did. But Satan was just using him. But Peter did not appreciate the fullness of how evil that was in terms of the purpose of God. Just like many things, us as Christians, we don't fully appreciate the great glorious thing that God's going to do through us. Some of these things we're not even going to realize or understand or perceive it until judgment day comes. And then the works will be declared. We'll come to the judgment and our works will be made manifest that they have been wrought in God. And we'll see a profound effect that our works have had that we never even realized. When did we see you in prison? When did we see you naked? When did we see you hungry? We did not perceive that this was even happening. So contrast that with someone who's always deliberately trying to emphasize what God's doing through me. Well, then they're aware of it, aren't they? They're aware of it, aren't they? They're always trying to enhance and rehearse the awareness of what God's doing through them to keep their conscience contrasted with these people. These people didn't even know. Nobody remembered the poor wise man. Don't seek after that stuff. Don't seek after vainglory. Don't exercise yourself in that stuff. Jesus warned them right off the bat. He nipped it right in the bud with the 70. The devils are subject to us through the name. I beheld Satan fall as lightning. That's how it all started with Satan. Don't do that. Don't exercise yourself like that. That's what Jesus told them. That's what humility is. That's what meekness is. That's wanting to see Jesus Christ glorified. That everything that you do, whatever you do, in word or deed, in meat or drink, you do all to the glory of God, that God may be glorified. So, when did we see you a stranger? You see, this is what we're saying. If Christ is in me, but I have a spirit of fear, then Christ is in bondage in me. Christ is imprisoned in me. He's trying to come forth, but my, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to yield. If I yield, this might happen. I might be persecuted. I might say something wrong. I might do something wrong. And fear will keep me from exercising faith and for, for, for allowing Christ to come forth in me. That is Christ in prison. He's imprisoned in the infirmities of my flesh, in the uncircumcision of my heart, whatever is in my heart that hasn't been circumcised yet, that's withholding. That truth of God is sitting in the unrighteousness of sinful flesh. That's what they said to Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. And so we come forth, but we come forth blind, bound in our grave clothes. We're walking by faith, but we're really not sure. We don't have the absolute, full description, uh, confident, all-knowing 
about what the purpose of God for us is. So we're feeling after God. We're coming forth in our grave clothes. While we still have bondages in our sinful flesh. And so what did he say to the Jews? Loose Loose them. Take those grave clothes off. Well, that's what the preaching is. That's what the ministry is doing. We're pulling those bandages off. So you can walk more freely. Walk more in the confidence of knowing what God's will is. So your light can increase more and more. When did we see you a hunger? When did we see you a stranger? Took thee in, naked, clothed thee. Inasmuch as you have done it unto the heathen prisoners down at the Colton County Jail. Nope. As much as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren. You have to spiritualize this scripture. You have to. This is a spiritually discerned story here. It's only spiritually discerned. <clears throat> then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And of course, same thing. For I was a hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Okay. Um. So you see this whole thing? Again, Jesus says, Thank you, Father. These, all these things, you showed it to the babes, and you hid it from the wise and, the wise and prudent, prudent, all the high guys there, all the big profile guys, all the high profile guys. They missed it, and you showed this to the babes. That's what I mean. I mean, God has this whole body thing tempered, so no man can say, I don't need you. I don't need your fellowship. No man can stand up and say, hey, I'm the whole show. Nobody can say that. Nobody. Not even the Apostle Paul can say that. Because God is doing things like this to balance things out. The fullness of revelation and truth in the hands of God's ministry is not as absolute as some ministers like to portray it. A minister might like to portray that he is in possession of truth and revelation and the counsel of God and or the whole counsel of God. But just remember, there are these scenarios here where God balances things out. Remember? Where the prophet could not see the angel of the Lord, which is Balaam, but the dumbass saw the angel of the Lord. Yeah. See? It's not as absolute as some of these ministers are trying to portray themselves as the holders and purveyors of, of all the truth. Now, certainly they are chief in, in Revelation and all that. So you have to give, give, give that much acknowledgement to that. But you have that and then you have this, this whole thing here where um, God reveals it to the babes and hides it, hides it from the high profile guys. Isn't that what humility is about? Isn't that what meekness is about? And uh, that's, that's so that we don't get lifted up. That is a safeguard for us. That's good for us. To look at it like this and pursue it like this. So I guess I made the point, right? The 70 wanted to focus and keep a constant conscious awareness of what God was doing through them. And yet all these other righteous examples, the folks didn't even know what was going on. Yeah. Or they were the poor wise man that nobody paid the particular attention to them. Right? So you might have hear people say, well, whoever pays attention to you, whoever listens to you, how much, how much exposure have you got? Well, so what? <laughs> right? It, that, that doesn't matter. Nobody remembered the poor wise man. That's no measure of anything. It's no measure of anything whether I'm like here preaching before six people or I got a 50,000 person crusade or worldwide ministry. What difference does it make? You're doing what God told you to do? God said it's few. It's few. Right? So I don't, I categorically reject all um, criticism and witness <coughs> against me personally 
that tries to challenge the legitimacy of the exercise of my office based on who's hearing you. you know, how many TV shows are you on? How much money did God send you? I couldn't care less. <laughs> I couldn't care less. God revealed it unto the babes here. Uh, you don't know what God will do. Cast your bread upon many waters. Maybe it'll prosper here, and maybe it won't. Maybe it'll prosper there, and maybe it won't. And maybe both places where you cast it, it'll prosper. Who knows? Who knows the cause and effect that ripples out and goes forth and goes forth. Every time you do an act or a word or a deed, it is a motion that goes forth into the creation. And that motion has an effect, and that effect expands and multiplies and spreads out and continues and continues. Who knows? What about men of God who seemingly preached and wrote things and nobody seemingly hardly ever heard or anything? Maybe they were dead and gone and somebody found the works that they have written in their archives and after they were dead, it did a, 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 a glorious work in the hearts of all of God's people and they're, they're dead. They're not even alive to see what, how the work went on through them. Your works do follow you. Your works are going to follow you. Into the judgment. And of course, we see whether our, our works, whether they're wrought in God or not. Okay. And again, I just was thinking again about um, challenges and everything else. Remember, we don't want to, you do, we don't want to stoop to the level of, of bickering and antagonism and all that kind of thing and accusation when, when people do that. And that's very much an, an issue of... Uh, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like him. Okay, there's another scripture that says, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. But this is talking about, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be also like him. So obviously, there is a fool, you can have, the fool can be in one of different states. You can be a fool because of this, or you can be a fool because of that. But what this is saying is, like, don't stoop to the level of someone who's just in his desperation beating the air and mocking and calling names, and there's no scriptural indictment against you. There's no spiritual precepts involved. It's just an insult. It's just name-calling. It's just a mockery with no substance behind it. It's baseless. Uh, it, it, it's reviling. It's an accusation. It's never clarified, it's never defined, it's never confirmed by scripture or scriptural precepts. Someone attacks you like that, don't stoop to their level and answer back like that. Because you're, you're, you'll, you'll be just like him. It'll just be a bunch of melee, name calling, back and forth. It'll be just a, a hodgepodge of a, of a mix up, melee, a confusion, everybody yelling, talking over top of each other and it's just a big mess of stuff. And nothing happens. So you don't enter into a conflict like that. That's being provoked by people who are just either brutish or being juvenile about it. And they have no substance in their accusation. Don't answer it. When he is reviled, he reviled not again. You only end up stooping and descending to their level. And I, I'm going to say this again. My, my brother had a, a, a thing on his, pinned on his... Um, Refrigerator. It's, it's, it just says, uh, don't enter into a conflict with a stupid man. Yeah. First, he'll bring you down to his level and he'll beat you by experience. Yeah. And that's kind of a worldly way of illustrating don't answer a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like him. Don't feel compelled to answer his challenge. Hold your peace. The Lord will fight your battles. And this is where I personally, I strive with this all the time. You know, someone lays charge on you. There's a, if, it's a, if it's a, done in a provoking way, it tries to compel a response out of you. But sometimes the people are just looking for the fight. You don't want to give them that. You don't want to minister to their folly. You don't want to stoop to their level. And this is where root in yourself is very valuable. Because if you can have root in yourself, then you don't, you can withstand the compelling urge to revile back or try to answer. 
in a, in a scenario where God doesn't want you to answer or where there's nothing productive in the will of God by answering. Just hold your peace. You have root in yourself. You're doing what God wants you to do, saying what God wants you to say. You're, you're exercising the wisdom of God. You're being careful. You know, if you're being accused, whatever, happy are you, right? Spirit of glory, let the spirit of glory and grace rest upon you. Okay. All right, that's it. I'm done. God bless you.